All right, how y'all doing? Well, let me be maybe the thousandth person to tell you Happy New Year. And uh, man, how's, how's 2018 going for you? I'm going to say it's off to a great start. If it ended now, it would have been an amazing year. <laughs> Unfortunately, it won't end now, and maybe I should say fortunately, because I am absolutely convinced that God has some amazing things in store for all of us that are a part of his plan, and that would be every one of you here. Those of you join us online, want to offer a welcome to you as well. I don't know about you, but I always look forward to this time of the year. I'll spend the last few weeks, sometimes certainly then zero down on the last days of a year, beginning to look into the new year, but even spending some time in reflection upon the past year. But the thing I like about a new year is what it represents. Some of you would agree with me, there's something about new. How many of you like new? Like new clothes, new outfit, new job, new friends, new whatever. But there's something about new that's compelling. And especially when we think about new beginnings, and it just presents to us an opportunity to push the reset button on life, if you will. Now, I also have experienced enough New Year's at this season of my life to be able to communicate to you that I know there's nothing magical that happens when you turn the page of that calendar from one year to the next. It's not like all of a sudden, 2017, everything changed from that moment, and it's magically going to be new in 2018. We all know that's true, but some of us forget that, and as a result, we do all kinds of things. We set goals. We make New Year's resolutions. Let me ask, how many of you have already made some New Year's resolutions? You've set some goals. There's some objectives you have in front of you. There's things you want to see happen in your life that haven't happened in the past, and we do that for a number of reasons, and the reason to me is pretty clear. In fact, are you aware of this? There's about 330 million people in the United States, and over 200 million of those 333 or 330 million are actually going to make New Year's resolutions or already did. That's sort of cool, exciting, holds within its realm potential. But here's the downside. Statistically, we know that year after year after year, only 8% of those people who make New Year's resolutions will see those goals and resolutions realized by the end of that year. So all I'm trying to communicate is there must be a better way. There's got to be a better way to get a fresh start, to reset your life, to push that reset button. And I believe that's really what we want to dive into in this series. And, and before I get ahead of myself, I, I need to ask this. Why do we make resolutions and set goals to resolve and resolve to make changes in the first place. Why is that? Why do you think? I would submit it's most likely because we're searching and reaching for something that's not yet a part of our current reality. We believe there's more out there for us that we haven't yet experienced, so we set goals, we make resolutions, we resolve that we're going to do something to make that part of our life a reality. Maybe it's there's something in our life that we want, or maybe there's something in our life that we don't want, like this thing called excess weight. In fact, the number one resolution goal that people make in the U.S. is all about health conditioning, but most of the time it circles back to weight loss. And why is it that by the end of that year, we not only didn't lose weight, but we actually gained more weight? Can I get a witness? Anybody want to give a testimony on that? All right, not really, but here's the point. Or maybe it's not physical weight, but it's the weight of stress that seemed to accumulate over the last 365 days that you're saying, I just want to find a way to download or get rid of that excess weight, that weight of stress. And if that's you, I have good news for you because this series is designed for you. We're launching a brand new series to launch a brand new year entitled First, and the tagline is Moving from Stress to Success. Now, success, I don't mean it necessarily just in the, the sense of, of, you know, climbing the corporate ladder. It could mean that. But holistically speaking, and, and so we want to move all of us to a place where we download stress and move to a place of greater success. 
research reveals, and you can put this down if you're taking notes, that the greatest cause of stress, you know what the greatest cause of stress research has backed this up, is living our lives independent of the one who made us. And his design for life, but even more specifically, his purpose for us personally. So if you're experiencing stress, I'm here to tell you that the greatest stress that any person on this planet will ever experience is a result of living our lives outside of being aligned with God's plan and his purpose for our lives personally. And so if we want to just download stress, all we need to do is make some adjustments and realign some things. Maybe it's all about putting first things first. Now, we hear that phrase a lot, but what does it really mean, and what does it really look like? And, and, and I'm here to tell you, I believe it will happen if we apply ourselves and receive Jesus' invitation from Matthew 11. Maybe you can relate to this. I encountered some of you on the way in, and some of you had a great year in 17, and some of you didn't have such a great year. Or maybe it was a pretty good year, but it didn't end so well. Or maybe it was a rough year, and it ended great. I just want to celebrate and thank you for enabling us as a church to finish 2017 strong because now we're able to step into 2018 even stronger. And that's because you stepped up to the plate over the last year and maybe took on some things. But here, maybe you're at this place in Matthew 11, and I love the message paraphrase on this. Jesus says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, I love this phrase, the unforced rhythms of grace. How many of you would say, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many would say that is a compelling invitation? What a great way to start a new year. To start a new year from a place of rest and being refreshed as opposed to being exhausted and worn out. In fact, this isn't in my notes, but I just feel compelled to share this because some of you already know this. Some of you, this will be a new insight. But do you realize that the Hebrew calendar is designed in such a way and the Hebrew day is designed in such a way that your day doesn't begin when the sun, goes, uh, when the sun comes up. Your day begins when the sun goes down. So listen to me. You're saying, well, is this just a matter of semantics and a play on words and trying to manipulate people's minds based on calendar and light and dark and all that? No, there's a principle here that is establishing God's word based on first and putting first things first. And here it is. I'm going to give it to you right out of the gate. Number one, the Hebrew day is structured in such a way from God's perspective, perspective that the day doesn't begin when the sun comes up, but when the sun goes down. And what do you do after the sun goes down? You rest. So listen, we don't rest from our work, but rather we rest so that we can work. And that was built in to God's design for creation when he said into this void, dark world, let there be light, and there was light. And then he said, after that, he said, and listen, look it up in Genesis. He says, and there was light. Night, and there was day, the first day. And then he created the next day. And there was night, and there was day, the second day. The third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And who did he make on the sixth day? Or what did he create on the sixth day? Huh? This isn't, this isn't a, t- a test. This isn't, I mean, it's like a pop quiz, I guess, you know. But he created you and me. He created man in his own image. And listen to this. He created us. We come into existence in the world that he made that was perfect. And in this perfect world that God made, he created us. And then how many of you know the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day, but God's seventh day was our first day. Our first day is rest. Our first day is the Sabbath. And we work out of our strength, not out of our weakness and exhaustion. Get it right, friends. God has a divine order for everything that's a part of his created order. And if we get it right and align ourselves with God's order and put first things first by his design, we will, listen, move from stress to success, from weakness to strength, from lack to abundance by following God's principles. I don't know. I was excited about it. 
Maybe you will be later on when you discover the reality of it too. But here we go. As we come to Jesus, he shows us what's important and what matters most. And as he was teaching how to rid ourselves of worry and stress in particular in one context, many of you are familiar with this text. In Matthew chapter 6, he's teaching. He says, don't worry about this and don't stress over that. Don't fret over this. Don't lose any sleep over that. And then he sort of culminates all of that teaching with some powerful language that we've all heard before in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And this is what he says. He gives us the insight and the answer we're looking for. Don't worry or stress over all these things, he says. Verse 33. But, everybody say but. But. Seek first. Everybody say seek first. His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things that you stress over, that you worry about, that you fret over, that you labor so hard for, he says, they'll just naturally be added to you. See, we get it backwards. We try to labor to acquire and achieve when God says, no, I don't want you to sweat and labor to achieve. I just want you to receive, and after you receive, then you'll be able to live the abundant life. And so it's all about order. Seek first. He's telling us that he'll take care of us and provide everything we need. But he's also telling us, are you ready for this? You can write it down. Order matters. Order matters. And as we learn to put first things first, we'll move from stress to success, as we've already talked about. That's precisely what this series and our corresponding 21 days of prayer and fasting are all about, which commence this evening when the sun goes down and getting our priorities in the right order because order matters. How many of you know whatever we do first influences the rest? Think about this. Whatever information I choose to expose myself to first thing in the morning when I come out of my rest is going to influence the rest of my day. And what's the first thing that you tap into when you get up in the morning? I'm sure that most of you have this mobile device right next to your bed. And you pick that up and say, oh, who liked my post from yesterday? Did I get a red heart on Instagram? Did anybody comment? What are my friends saying? What are they posting? Yeah, they live on the East Coast, so they got up before me, and they got, you know, they got the advantage here. And, and you're looking, and then all of a sudden, some news feed comes across your mobile device, and you're reading all this bad news. And then that influences the rest of your day. Whatever we do first will influence the rest. Order matters. Order matters. Order is extremely important. Let me illustrate. Some of you have probably seen the illustration like this before. And by the way... We have devotional guides for you to pick up on your way out if you didn't get one on the way in. And we have enough for everybody to take one. And then we'll also email those to you if your email is a part of our mailing um, uh, system. So, all right, let's get back to the illustration. So you've heard this before, but the big rock theory and all about putting things in order. Now, let's say that your life is already pretty full because you started your day... (coughs) on Facebook, this probably represents 70% of the people in the room, and you're thinking, oh, that's right, I, I have to go to work today, and, um, you know, at some point, I need to probably exercise today, and, you know, if, if I get around to it, I'm going to pray sometime today, and we're working to get all these things worked in, and, man, I probably ought to spend some time with my family today, and, and I, I probably have this going on today. And then I want to do this today, and boy, I got this going on, and oh God, I, I probably should spend some time with him. And there's no room for it in your day. Principle of the Big Rocks teaches us what? What if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll break down what that means in a moment, because I always wondered, and then... I sort of align my life with what his plan is, and I get my other big rocks, priorities and values and purposes in place, and then I have time for some recreational pursuits. Maybe it's going to a ball game. Maybe it's, you know, exercising. 
Maybe it's some other kind of thing that you enjoy that's recreational for you, that brings life to you, and you have time for all these other things. And then, guess what? Then you think, okay, let me, uh, now that I have all those things in place and I put first things first in my day, my week, my month, my calendar, now let me see. Let's see. I got some time to go fishing. I got some time to maybe uh, spend a little time on social media, and I got a little time for this, and, and I have a little time. Boy, I, you know what? I can even work all that into my day, and all of a sudden you realize that you have time for be careful, Keith, don't knock this thing over. Everything. And you know what? You even have some time for some coffee. <laughs> Maybe even some dessert. After the fast, by the way, on all these things. But the point is, you got time for everything when you put first things first. Ta-da. Let's break it down. What does that really mean? I, I've always wondered. I, I've read that verse in and I get these ideas, and I think, okay, so seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. What, what does that really mean? How do I work that out in my life? Again, I want to say order matters, and all of us know this, but few of us really live it out. Everybody ends up somewhere. Can I tell you this? This is a quote from Craig Groeschel. Everybody ends up somewhere, but not everybody ends up somewhere on purpose. And so order matters order has power let me give you a couple of thoughts why order has power first thought is simply this order determines capacity we'll spend more time with it over the next few weeks but going back to matthew chapter 6 he's saying don't worry about all these things what you're going to eat what you're going to wear where you're going to live all that kind of stuff um he says you know these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers Notice he's saying there should be something different that marks the life of those who claim to have a relationship with me from those who don't. Those things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. What's the point of that? Let me push the pause button on the reading. Once I surrender my life to Jesus out of response to receiving his amazing grace and his forgiveness, all of a sudden the Father assumes full responsibility for any needs that I'll ever have. If I really believe that to be true, I will live different. I will trust him and everything he has to say. He says, but seek first. Everybody say again, but seek first. How many are great for all the buts in the Bible? <laughs> I don't have time for that. I was going to say you all need to get yourself some buttology. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Order determines capacity. When you put first things first, you have room for more stuff in your life than you ever realize because there's something about honoring God and putting him first that he multiplies your time back to you and allows you to get more done in less time. It's the same principle of tithing. Somehow, it's easier and better, as Mephimba shared last week, to live off of 90% with the blessing of God than 100% without it. Your money goes further when you put first things first. Order determines capacity. Number two, order communicates priority. Isn't that right? How many of you would agree with this? We have time for whatever we do first. We have money for whatever we spend it on first. Order communicates priority. I'll come back to that next week. Number three, order impacts the rest. We've already communicated that and illustrated that. But it, whatever we put in first becomes the organizing principle. Can I say it this way? Whatever we put in our life first is the organizing principle that governs the rest, that influences the rest. Proverbs 3, 6, and then 8 and 11 sort of gives us a picture of that. Let me read a couple verses to you. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In how many of your ways? How many of you know that's pretty inclusive? And how many of you know there's nothing too small for God to be concerned about, and there's nothing too big for God to attend to? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and what happens as a result of that? He will make your path straight. He'll make sure you have room for whatever you need in your life. And he says, when you do this, when you seek God first, and acknowledge him in all your ways, he will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. How many say health would be good to have? 
He'll bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And then he says this, and this isn't just about money here in this text. I believe the principle transcends that. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then, everybody say then. He's saying, you do this, God will do this. Listen, we can't claim God's promises if we're not living by his principles. I have no authority by which I can petition God and say, God, will you please provide for me financially, help me to get this job, if I'm not honoring the principle of returning to him first, the first fruits, the tithe. It's not that he doesn't hear us. He's just saying, I already told you what to do. You get that in order, I'll do that for you. And then he says, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So the first, are you ready for this? Has the power to bless the rest. The first has the power to bless the rest. Many of us claim one thing but live another way. As a result, our lives are out of order and we're feeling the effects of it. The distance here, I want to say this, the distance but between the truth we know and the truth we live equals the pain we experience. Let me say that one more time. The distance, the gap between the truth we know intellectually and the truth we live out practically determines the level of pain we experience in life. Relationally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, practically, every arena of life. And so the good news is this, there's a solution. We serve a God who has the power to how many, you know, turn things around and give us a fresh start and a new beginning. And that can happen today once we draw a line in the sand, say from this day forward, I'm putting first things first. And I'm going to honor God and align myself with his principles. And all of his promises are relevant and applicable in my life. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, the answer or solution is revealed in the pain. Do you ever realize that pain is a great communicator and a great revealer? And so what's the, what's the pain? The greatest cause of stress is living our lives, what? Independent of the one who made us and his design for life in general and his purpose for us personally. So if we're going to move from stress to success, we need to get the order right and put first things first. What does that look like? What does it mean, as I referenced earlier on in the message, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? Well, there are three guiding principles that help us to determine what comes first. In other words, here are really, if I can help you out today, and it's helped me out a lot in my own personal life, here are the big rocks. Because some of you are sitting there right now. How many are thinking, so Keith, what are the big rocks? How many have wondered that? None of you? Oh, maybe somebody online. How many of you guys? Are? Yeah, tens of thousands of them online are wondering. Join with them right now. Let me help you out. Because uh, I wonder, what, what are the big rocks? And, and how many have all heard this? Well, it's God and then family. And if you're married, it's your spouse and it's your kids and, and priority structures. And then it's your job and then it's your recreational pursuits. And then it's, if you have, and, and we sort of try to, as if one thing somehow means more to God than the next. I, I believe there's a better way to look at this prioritization of life when it comes to the big rocks. You're saying, well, what is it? Because I don't believe it's a one-size-fits-all. So then how do we discover what first things first look like in our everyday lives? Number one, identify your values. Identify your values. This is what really matters to you based upon your relationship with Jesus. In other words, our core values are what we stand for and what we're willing to go to the wall for. And for me, the longer I've lived, there's less I'm willing to go for the wall, to the wall for and really stand for that really matters. And so it's somehow a massaging over a season of developing some what I call core values. So the question we ask here is this. Here, here's the question. If you're asking questions under each of these to help get answers, what do you love deeply? I mean, I mean at your core. Now, how, you, it's easy to say, well, I, I love Jesus and I love my family. We say that, but how many know the test isn't in what we say? The test is in what we do. And so what are my core values? In other words, here's how I've learned to identify my values. It, it, it's a values test, if you will. Here's a way to sort of 
put the filter out there this week and test where your values are at. You know it's a core value when you feel something so deep in your gut that whenever it's violated and or celebrated or upheld, something inside goes off favorably or negatively. So what's that look like in my world? If I, I tried to break it down and get real personal. First of all, honor and integrity, I've learned over the years, have been established as a core value for me. Now, don't confuse integrity with perse- perfection. They are not one and the same. Because nobody can live up to the standard of perfection. Nobody does right all the time. That's what the revelation of God's word is. Because of the fall, we are subject to the fall, and we don't always do the right thing but integrity is this it's doing the right thing even after you've done the wrong thing even if it's the hardest thing there is to do and so integrity but honor there, there's something inside of me whenever i see it lived out whether in real life or in a movie i i, I see that like uh there's some some more war type movies that sometimes i enjoy watching and and it's not that I'm into war and killing things. It's, that it's what's inside of it, like men of honor. When I watch something like that, and honor is upheld. And, and what was the guy that uh, was the, the, the Navy sea, deep sea diver? And um, Cuba Gooding played it in the movie. And all of a sudden, he's commanded to step up. And he takes those eight steps in the classroom. And he just gives honor. And so, I, get, I get emotional about that, guys. How about you? Men, don't tell me you're not emotional. It's what is, you, uh, what is it that you're emotional about? And I watch that, and I'm brought to tears. Why? Because it taps into a core value of honor for me. When I see it dishonored and not upheld, I feel violated. Honor is a core value for me. Second, and I, I, I lump this together because I, I can't divorce one from the other, but for me, a core value that's just been reinforced over the years in my life is this beautiful wonderful, mystical, messy thing called the church that's found in Jesus where there's the beautiful marriage of grace and truth. I, I, I can't step away from it. I almost feel personally violated when somebody's critical of the church. It doesn't have to be 3D. It can be a church. And, and I find myself feeling violated when somebody is critical of the church. And, and within that, in fact, my greatest wounds personally have come from the church and church people personal, deep wounds from the church. However, I'm still engaged in church work because at my core, I love what Jesus loves. I love the church and everything God created it to be. And when it's done right, it's to be celebrated, and I find myself just full of elation and excitement, celebration, and worship. You can't step away from something that's a core value, no matter how many times you've been hit. And then third, Another third core value for me, and this might sound somewhat, well, of course, Keith, but no, it's not of course, because it's not necessarily on everybody's list, and it may sound pretty general, but it's certainly true for me. It's just people. Let me break it down. What do I mean by that? I genuinely love people. Most of you know my journey. I went to college for business. I ended up in a business partnership, and then a couple of years into that, God started to mess with me, and he started to tell me that he had plans for my life that were different than my plans for my life. And, and because I was passionately in love with Jesus and I was genuinely trying to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, I let him call the shots because that means I'm not. How I many you know you can't be in control and God in control at the same time? And so I cooperated with what I really believe was God's leading, and I sold out of my business, and I entered into full-time vocational ministry and stepped into that world. But I never got into church work because of it, it was church work. I never got into it because of its organizational uh, uh, strengths or weaknesses. I, I never got into it. I got into it because of people. And over the years at our previous church, we watched it grow from one service at one location to nine locations across four states and multiple services at every campus and there were literally thousands of people showing up every weekend i wasn't engaged in it i never got in it for the numbers i get in it because i cared about people and that's still while i'm in the game today and so all about people but what do i believe about people i believe to my core that every one of you is a 10 in some area of your life that God made you on purpose and for a purpose, that there's no person on this planet that's an accident or a mistake. I say these kind of things all the time because I believe to my core that your parents may not have planned you, but God did. 
And he has great plans for your life. You're not an accident. You're not a random collection of molecules that just morphed into existence that somehow came out of a swamp or out of a tree because your monkey is in your background, your pedigree. I believe that the wisdom of a divine God who's intelligent in all that he does intentionally does everything that he does, created you on purpose and for a purpose and knew from before the foundation of the world what he wanted to do through you. And that leads to the second point. So number one, I have to identify my values. Number two, I have to discover my purpose. My personal why. Why do I exist? Why did God create me? Why did he put me on this planet? Proverbs 29, 18. It's a verse that many of you are familiar with. He said what? Where there is no vision, the people perish. What's he saying? Where where you don't have a clear sense of revelation from God about his direction and plan for your life, you die emotionally. And then you try to find life and all those things that don't satisfy. The Hebrew word for vision there is kazon. It, It literally means vision that produces motivation, direction, and purpose. The happiest, listen to me, the most fulfilled and successful people I know are, listen to me, not those with the least amount of problems or challenges in their life, but those who are living out their God-ordained purpose. Everybody has problems. How many of you know that? Turn to the person next to you and say, you really have problems. No, no, you don't need to tell them that, but it's probably true. How many of all God's children got problems? My point isn't, do you have problems? My point is, how do you process those problems? And if you don't have a context through which you can process your problems, you get delusion, you get depressed, you get just so discouraged that you want to throw in the towel on life because you can't see that there's a bigger picture and something on the other side. But when you have a divine revelation from God of what his plan is for your life, come hell or high water, you're still in the game, you're still going to worship him, you're still going to serve him, and you can overcome any obstacle. Those are the people that are winners in life. And so, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12 and 17 God, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May the favor of the Lord, our God, rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What's he saying there? God, as you answer that prayer of teaching me how to number my days because I have a purpose on this planet, and once I do that, you give me wisdom, and the outflow of wisdom that comes from having a revelation of his purpose and plan for your life is this, that he's going to bless the work of your hands. You follow the principle, the promise is applicable. It just comes into place. And so the earlier in life we discover our purpose, the better. Listen, not only will you get a jump start on all of your peers, but I'm here to tell you, you're going to avoid a whole lot of missteps and heartache along the way. I love working with young people. In fact, I'm going to make an announcement just later in the service. We're, we're going to launch this year our intentional design ministry to fifth and sixth graders and then the next-gen ministry from 14 to 25-year-olds. I can't wait to launch that. I love, love, love working with young people. Why? Because if you can shape them while they're still shapeable, you don't have to detox them as much. A lot of you had to be detoxed. You're still getting detoxed. You have so many patterns of behavior that were established in your life, you've got to relearn all that stuff. The earlier in life we can discover God's plan for our life, the less missteps we'll make and the less heartache we'll experience. Why? Because we stay on the path that he has for us. So the question here is this. Question under number one on, on identifying my values is, what do you deeply love? The question under number two of discovering your life purpose is, what is my overarching life mission? Why? Do I even exist? Why did God create me and place me on his plan in the first place? Why am I here? And and, and maybe a sub point to this as you're beginning to break it down. When do you feel the most fully alive? When do you feel the most fully alive? Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Philip's paraphrase, beautiful paraphrase. Live life then with a due sense of responsibility. Not as those who don't know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time despite all the difficulties of these days. Don't be vague, but firmly grasp what you know to be the will of God. 
Don't be casual about it. Don't be cavalier about it. Be intentional. And he says, don't be vague about this thing. Let, let's figure this out. And let's grasp firmly what we know to be the will of God. That communicates to me that I can know God's will for my life. And we, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go in this series. And this is why we as a church exist. How many of you know, if you've been through Next Steps, we communicate all the time. We're here to help every person we can come, find their place in God's plan. That vision statement for 3D Church is born out of my personal journey and calling in life that I believe is under the design and umbrella of what God's plan is for all of creation that finds expression in your life personally. And so we have processes in place. We don't just leave it to chance. We don't just throw it out there and say, you go figure it out. We actually have some tests that you take and inventory and evaluations and assessments of yourself. And all of a sudden you walk away of discovering what we call your unique God-given design. And the word design is broken down as an acrostic. And for each one, there is a point of reference that we give homework application to where you can figure it out. Look, can I just say, if you haven't gone through next steps yet, jump into the next one. It's, it's going to be a fun journey. It's, our Next Steps classes aren't all about 3D Church. They're all about you at the end of the day. Because here's what I'm convinced of. If I help you find your place in God's plan, you'll figure out the rest. You'll figure out what that looks like in the church. You'll figure out what that looks like in the world. You'll figure out that what it looks like in everyday life. And so sign up. Sign up. Because I am passionately committed to helping you figure it out and live it out it's not enough to figure it out and put it on paper if you don't live it out because then you're more frustrated than you were before now you have information and revelation that you're not living and that's the gap that creates the greatest pain in our life so number one what's it mean to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness identify my values righteousness what's right in the eyes of god discover my purpose he came here to make us ambassadors of his kingdom. And so the only way I can seek first his kingdom is if I know what my plan is in his kingdom. And every kingdom has a king, and the king calls the shots. And the king of the kingdom of God is King Jesus. And if I'm really yielded to him and in alignment with him, then my life will align with that. And I live out of that sense of purpose. And now, all of a sudden, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says, everything else you need is going to be added. And so what's the third big idea, big rock? It's love your God. Love your God. If somebody asked you, what is your aim in life? How, how would you answer that? Some of you would say, my, my aim in life is, is just to be happy. How many times do you hear that in a week? Oh, I just want to be happy. You know, God's got to be okay with me quitting this job or breaking off this marriage because after all, he just wants me to be happy. Really? Is that really what the Bible says? I don't think so. If it is, I've missed it for 30 years. How many of you are so stinking happy in your marriage that you, you just wouldn't ever think about, you know, looking somewhere else how I many never had a bad day in your marriage liar liar pants on fire <laughs> listen he's not about your happiness he's about your wholeness making you more like jesus and he uses these beautiful thing called people that i would redefine as heavenly sandpaper to work that out in our lives how I many are married to some of that stuff Okay, you got your marriage thing figured out, but then you had kids. And that just introduced a whole new level of sandpaper. <laughs> and then they became teenagers. You know the story. But some would say, well, it's just my, my aim in life is to be successful. Or it's my aim in life to find somebody to love. Whatever you would answer that question with is your dominant life principle. Every one of us have one, whether we realize it or not. If my dominant life principle is fun, then when I am choosing between two events, I will always default to the one that's the most fun not necessarily the one that has the most purpose. If my dominant life principle is something else, see, I'm naturally going to choose the one that is my dominant life principle. Does that make sense? 
And the Bible says, as a follower of Jesus, my dominant life principle is to love. Love God, love people. But he said, first, love the Lord your God. See, love really is life's greatest aim. It's the big idea of the whole Bible. Some religious leaders pulled Jesus aside one day and inquired, you know, Lord, there are about 600 laws here that the the Pharisees uphold, and and can you just wrap it up for us? It seems to be overwhelming. How many of you have ever read the Bible, gone to church, introduced yourself to a a relationship with Jesus, and and sometimes there's like this information overload, and you're saying, I just, my head's spinning. Where do I go with all this? What really matters most? That's where Jesus' followers were at. They said, you know, these Pharisees got all these laws, and they got this, and they got that. What really matters? Can you break it down for us? Tell, tell me what's the most important thing, and what did Jesus answer with? Jesus replied, you must simply love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind and all of your strength. And this is my first and greatest commandment. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's why I say one of the big rocks has to be love God first. What does that look like? It means I spent, how many of you would agree, if you love somebody, you spend time with that person. And not just, haphazardly or whatever's left over come on somebody when you really love somebody you spend time with them first if you really love jesus you spend time with him first he's your first big rock come on and that finds practical expression i spend time with him i spend time with his people i'm actively engaged in his kingdom advancement through the local church that's what it means to love god first what it looks like and he's saying if i'll do that if i'll seek first god's kingdom which is based on jesus reign which is one of love and not law grace and not legalism then out of receiving from god i'm able to give to others throughout my day think of what how different your world would be and our world would be collectively if every one of us would seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness And we found practical expression of that by spending time with him first in the day and asking him to fill our tanks so every conversation I step into throughout that day, I step into full, not empty. I step in with something to give, not looking to receive. How much different would your marriage be if your conversations were all about what you could do to serve your spouse or as a parent, what you could do to serve your kids? Or how about this, as a teenager, how to serve your parents? That's a revolutionary idea. Seriously, seriously. And what if every one of us approached every day like that, where we sought first the kingdom of God, and he filled us with his love, he filled us with his truth, he filled us with his spirit, he filled us with his grace, he filled us with his wisdom. And then I enter into a conversation, and what just naturally spills out of me is love, grace, truth, wisdom, revelation, come on. It had changed the landscape of your world. And that's the invitation. For the next 21 days, we're going to give every one of us practical opportunity to step into that space through our annual 21 days of prayer and fasting because fasting is this friends fasting i say it all the time creates space for god to fill with himself so that i live out of fullness and health not emptiness lack and need and so that's what we're going to do for the next 21 days and so the two questions i invite you to ask yourself right now And really, you're asking the Lord, not yourself. So here's the two questions we're all going to ask God right now over these next few moments in our response time. God, what do you want me to fast from? And you fill in that blank as he speaks to you. It could be certain foods. It could be certain meals. It could be certain days of the week or any combination of that. On top of that, it could be recreation sports social media facebook instagram that whole world did you know the average number of hours that young teenagers today spend on social media and their parents aren't far removed from it what if we took let's just say hypothetically it was two hours a day what if you took two hours a day for the next 21 days and instead of filling it with all kinds of bad news and somebody else's highlight reel compared to your real life that brings you into depression come on somebody and let god through the spirit of his word and his truth fill you with himself and his love and his wisdom and his grace how much different would our lives be Turn off 
the noise so you can hear his still, small voice. I guarantee you it will revolutionize and transform your life. Guarantee you. Because every time God speaks, something miraculous happens. And the word he spoke to me for 2018 is supernatural reproduction, growth, and increase. If you're going to open yourself up to that and come under the flow of that, then I invite you to step into a space where God can fill it with that kind of activity because you're one word from him away from your breakthrough. You are. But if you don't ever create the space, he can't fill it. That's what this is about. This isn't about legalism. This isn't about trying harder and working harder. This is about, God, you've been so good to me. I just want to say thank you. And I open myself up, and I'm going to create space for you to fill. And here's what you're asking. God, what do you want me to fast from? And here's the other side of it. What do you want me to fast for? Because prayer and fasting throughout Scripture always worked hand in glove. Listen, if you just fast, whether it's food, a meal, social media, and let's just say it's an hour a day that you've cleared the schedule, but you fill that hour with more work and more of your honeydew list and more to do things and, and more recreation other than what you just said you're going to push, push aside. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. And you allow that. If all you do is fill it up, how many of you know you're just going to get hangry? Hungry and downright angry. The goal isn't just to create space to fill with other stuff and more of the same. The goal is to create space for God to so fasting was always done in tandem in partnership with prayer. And prayer isn't just a one-way conversation. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. I speak, but then he speaks. And how many of you think that what he has to say is probably more important than what I have to say? And he speaks to me through his word and by his spirit. I've talked enough. Father, we thank you for your presence here. Lord, I am absolutely convinced that this could be the best year of our, our life ever as we learn how to put first things first. And so we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us in these next few moments. Lord, would you reveal to us what you want us to fast from and what it is that you want us to fast for? What, we, what are you going to believe God for in 2018? I just want to encourage you to put in front of that the word supernatural. Holy Spirit, speak in these next few moments. Give us grace to hear what your Spirit is saying, and then give us the courage to honor you with it. First things first, in Jesus' name.